Hello, and thanks for joining us today for the latest Technology Networks webinar, Engineering Mucosal Barriers from Organoids to Organs on Chips. I'm Tom Kostjewski, I'm the Director of Biology at CMBio, and I'm here to moderate today's event. I'm really pleased to have my friend and collaborator, Dr. Linda Griffith, joining us today as our presenter. A really warm welcome to you, Linda. Linda is the Professor of Biological and Mechanical Engineering and Teaching Innovation at the School of Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she's also the Director of the Centre of Gynecological Research. I think it's fair to say that Linda is a true pioneer in the field of tissue engineering, and her achievements include the first tissue engineered cartilage in the shape of a human ear, the commercialization of the 3DP printing process for the manufacture of FDA approved scaffolds, the commercialization of the 3D perfused liver chip for drug evaluation, which was done with ourselves here at CMBio, and the development of numerous synthetic matrices used to study tissue morphogenesis. She led one of two major DARPA supported body on a chip programs, resulting in the first platform to culture 10 different mini human organ systems interconnecting continuously for a month. And she leads the fields of physiomimetics, integrating platforms, platform technologies with systems biology and systems immunology to humanize drug development for the most challenging chronic inflammatory diseases. Linda is also extremely passionate about research into inflammatory diseases that affect reproductive biology and gynecology, and she is a renowned expert in the field of endometriosis and adenomyosis. Linda has over 200 peer reviewed scientific publications and holds over a dozen patents. She's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, a Radcliffe Foundation Fellowship, and several awards from professional societies. She currently serves on the advisory board of the Society for Women's Health Research and has served on several NIH advisory councils, including the advisory committee to the director. She even led the development of the Biological Engineering Bachelor's Degree Program at MIT, which in 2005 was the first new undergraduate major to be launched in 39 years. A central theme to all her research is connecting experimental systems to systems biology, and she continually leads highly interdisciplinary and translational projects involving basic scientists, clinicians, and engineers to solve important problems in medicine and biology. Great to have you with us, Linda. Following the webinar, we will have a Q&A session and we welcome any questions you may have. You can submit these questions for the Q&A session at any time during the presentation. To ask a question, please click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner, enter your question into the box on the right-hand side of the screen and click submit. We will answer as many as possible during the time available. For any questions we don't have time to get to, we will ensure to contact you offline with an answer. Please remember, do ask a question at any time, even whilst watching the webinar on demand. So without further ado, I will pass over to Linda. Thank you so much for having me um, join this webinar and share with you some of the work we're doing and some very, very interesting clinical problems. Um, I've titled this Engineering Mucosal Barriers, and it's true that engineers are often problem driven. And you've alluded to one of the key problems that I came to somewhat late in my career, thinking about how we could improve drug development for endometriosis, a disease that remains very enigmatic in the research and clinical communities. I was drawn to this when my very own niece, Caitlin Bradbury, who's shown here on the left uh, with as a child at a family wedding. And when she started having her period when she was about 12 years old, she had intense pain and terrible symptoms. She was dismissed initially by her female doctor as being uh, hysterical and making things up because she didn't want to go to school. She loved school. When my sister brought me uh, this set of problems and which endured over many years, I got her referred to Atlanta, a surgeon in Atlanta, Dr. Sina Najat, you see here and she was diagnosed with the disease endometriosis when she was 17. Endometriosis is when the lining of the uterus grows outside of the uter uterus ectopically, invading many abdominal organs and causing intense pain, infertility, and other symptoms. She uh, has... Um, Su successfully been treated by uh, both Dr. Najad and my collaborator, Keith Isaacson, and she now has a beautiful, uh, he's now a toddler, he was a baby here. Um, so a challenge with endometriosis and why uh, we need more sophisticated things to study it is that in some way similar to cancer, it invades organ systems. So for example, here, there are two huge lesions in this patient's bowel 
and she had 10 centimeters of her bowel resected. How can we be develop better drugs? This animates so much of the research in my lab and research on mucosal barriers. So it's fascinating to compare and contrast the endometrium, which is a mucosal barrier, um, with another very fascinating mucosal barrier, the intestine or the colon. Uh, mucosal barriers are the gates to all internal organs. They secrete mucus as a function, and they also have enormous immunological roles. They communicate with the outside world and they defend the body from the outside world. And so there's many similarities between these mucosal barrier tissues and also some differences that we'll describe. Now, one of the reasons it's fun and interesting in one laboratory to study these two very different um, mucosal barriers involves how uh, we can develop tools. In the case of the endometrium in the U.S., there's very little fun Funding. In the case of the gut, there's intense, intense, intense interest in the human gut microbiome, which we'll discuss today, as well as in um, other chronic inflammatory diseases of the gut. So it's it's there's more diversity of funding available. So we let we develop a lot of technologies and apply them to the GI tract, and then we deploy them for the endometrium. And so I'm sharing some tips from a rather well-established scientist to some of you who may be starting out in your career. There's there's many ways uh, to skin the cat, as they say. It's not just that practical issue, though. There's some fascinating intellectual issues that arise when you're comparing and contrasting these two very different functions, functioning organ systems. Um, and the gut, a tremendous amount is known about the stem cell compartments. A tremendous now amount is not known because there's fascinating data coming out now about the plasticity of um, cells that lie outside the crypt. So we know that in the um, intestine where you have a crypt lumen structure, as you can see here, that the proliferating cells in the bottom of the crypt are the stem cells, and then you have transit cells, and then you have the luminal cells that are more differentiated. But in cases of injury, you can see some plasticity, and this is an area of intense, intense investigation. In the endometrium, what's fascinating is that there's far, far fewer studies, but those that have been done are starting to reveal that there may be stem and particular genitor cells up near the lumen all the time. So in the endometrium, you have a region that is always retained, and then the functionalis, which is shed every month in cycling women. And it's, it's uh, becoming apparent now that there may be epithelial stem and progenitor cells up here in this luminal part as evidenced by uh, in situ hybridization for the stem cell marker, epithelial marker LGR5. Uh, a lot more to learn about this. Great to compare and contrast these two very different tissues. Um, so let's build a wish list of our mucosal barrier model, an in vitro model, things that we would like to capture in it. Obviously, we would love to have some 3D crypt lumen architecture. This is true for the endometrium. It would be a gland lumen for endometrium. Mucus microbes, continuous flow on the apical side. In the case of the colon, we want this to be strictly anaerobic, totally, totally anaerobic. And even in the endometrium and cervix, for example, we would want it mostly anaerobic. We'd also like a perfusible microvascular network that would allow us to look at how things are transported from the apical side here into the blood, a lymph drainage. And we would like to be able to co-culture a microbiome, including the very strict um, anaerobes that reside in the gut. And we'd also like to have incorporated immune cells and stromal cells and some degree of tissue complexity, particularly if we're studying immunological properties of these tissues. So how can we get there? Um, I'm going to start a little bit with some of the tissue engineering side, and this derives from our work in endometriosis. So in the talk, I'm going to move back and forth between the endometrium and gut and signal when I am. So as uh, mentioned at the outset, we think a lot about how to conceptualize the disease and conceptualize immune networks in endometriosis, the lining of the endometrium, uh, uterus, the endometrium, shown here as an epithelial barrier, in interacting with stroma and immune cells. 
Um, every month uh, when a woman has her period, some of the tissue actually goes out through the fallopian tubes into the peritoneal cavity, where you have a fluid that contains about a million immune cells per mil, including a lot of macrophages. In most women, this tissue is cleared, but in some women it implants and grows and invades as you saw in the earlier slide. And what we'd love to know is how the inflammatory processes here and immune processes work and how they're not working. And so we've studied a lot in patients I won't go into today to motivate why we want to build in vitro models to study patient specific kinds of inflammatory processes with their tissues. So the first step is to realize in studying this disease that there's really two kinds of models models we need. One, the utopic tissue, which has this gland um, lumen architecture, and then the ectopic tissue, which is, of course, completely enclosed um, in tissue, so there's no outlet for the glands, and you get these sort of cystic-like structures that has epithelia surrounded by stroma and often some smooth muscle cells and immune cells. And this is work of a couple of fabulous graduate students who left, since left the lab, and it's all published. So what we did to address this problem, because remember, we want a co-culture of epithelial and immune uh, and stromal cells that we could then later incorporate immune cells into, is we adapted some um, technology developed decades ago, originally by Jeff Hubble's lab, but a modular synthetic hydrogel technology, but we tremendously, tremendously customized it and thought about a parameter space for epithelial cells in particular. So the general approach, which is widely used in biomaterials, is to start with some kind of polyethylene glycol synthetic polymer that's branched. I show an eight-arm polymer here, and attach peptides to it that can interact with cells. And then uh, there's also free ends here that can be used to cross-link these macromers together, you add a peptide crosslinker, you add cells, you carry out some kind of chemical change, light or pH or otherwise, uh, some other ways you can initiate, and you make a beautiful transparent hydrogel as you see here, and it, you can completely safely encapsulate cells. These happen to be uh, an organoid of a tumor uh, of, of an endometrial epithelial cell line. Um, now, in setting out to make a matrix that can do all the things we want, essentially we want to replace matrigel. Um, I know many people have a love-hate relationship with matrigel, and what we want to do is capture things we love about it and get rid of the things we hate, like the like-to-lot variability, the huge number of unknown components, the um, inability to control degradation, et cetera. So we take what we call a semi-empirical Q signal response approach to matrix design where we think about the physical properties of the matrix. Do we want it soft? Do we want it stiff? So a lesion may be very stiff and a utopic tissue, the endometrium itself could be soft. What cells do we want there? The density and so on. What integrins and adhesion receptors do they have? And then other aspects of it, including how, uh, the crosslinks might be degraded by cells and so on. And so there's a whole landscape of parameters that we can control in a completely modular fashion. And what we bring to the table is thinking a lot about the biology of the interactions. Furthermore, we um, aim to be able to dissolve these matrices and capture the cells and the products that they make locally um, in a very simple way. So we have invented a gel that can do this, and I want to describe it a little bit because we have shared it with a lot of labs around the world and they found it very useful when they need to culture finicky epithelial cells with stromal cells and we're in the process of um, having it evaluated for commercialization. So the first um, thing that we did was uh, just demonstrate that we could encapsulate a cell line with primary human stromal cells and do some screening for what kinds of ligands in the matrix, what kind of integrin interacting ligands would drive a proper polarization. And so here you can see that the PEG hydrogel, we get properly polarized, meaning we get a basement membrane and we have apical actin and a complete lumen here, and that you can co-culture with stroma, and this is compared to matrigel. Um, and so when we designed this, we started out um, realizing a few things. First, we uh, 
made a ligand that captures more of the natural matrix uh, ligand fibronectin has these two domains. Most people in the field use an RGD uh, containing peptide to bind to RGD tar uh, binding ligands, but this has very low affinity. And so we added a synergy site and made a simple synthetic peptide that seems to interact very well with integrins. And this is a scale model of the crosslink. It's, it's very, very schematized, but gives you an idea of the size scale of the polymers, the ligands, and the integrins on the surface of a cell. Um, now, when we started out trying to just make in a trans well, a stromal epithelial co-culture uh, on top, the epithelia on top of the gel and, and stroma in the gel, it turns out they um, were, uh, and, and we, we did this, we found that uh, the adhesion ligands were not enough to keep the, the epithelial sheet from staying as part of the tissue. The epithelial sheet would delaminate. And what we reasoned is that PEG is a great um, tissue because it's fairly inert. It's like a chassis on which you build biological interactions. And what we reasoned is that epithelial cells were producing their own basement membrane, but PEG wasn't allowing it to accumulate very well because stuff just doesn't stick well to PEG. So this is one of its desired properties. So we engineered in some peptides that actually can bind to and sequester cell-produced matrix. So if we put a peptide in that binds to, here I'm showing fibronectin, um, it can, the peptide binds to fibronectin and lets the cell assemble a fibronectin matrix, which then can assemble a more complex matrix, for example, with collagen one. Similarly, um, we can include peptides that bind to laminin and collagen four to stabilize basement membrane. So when we did this, we found, in fact, that including peptides that bind to basement membrane, and these are small peptides, so we're making a very modular, very well-defined synthetic gel, entirely synthetic. So everything is made in the lab and can be very tightly quality controlled. So we found that we accumulated a lot more basement membrane and this has uh, all been published. And that we, in the stroma, if we look there, we would accumulate a more um, complex matrix, including type um, one collagen, and um, that we also could get immune cells to move into that matrix and move around. So, so this one size fits all matrix that responds locally to stroma and to epithelial cells has some advantages over matrix gel because now it's good for the stroma and good for the epithelia in a very low locally responsive manner. Um, okay, so we've done a little bit of tissue engineering, but what I showed you was primarily done with a cell line. And we all know cell lines behave differently than primary cells. And if you go to our publications, you can see all the different inflammatory markers and so on that are produced by the primary cells compared to the cell lines for the endometrium. Um, and we were limited in the case of the endometrium because the epithelial cells could not be propagated in culture to make tissue banks. So a hugely, hugely impactful pair of papers came out in 2017, building on Hans Cleaver's and Toshi Sato's demonstration that you could expand the epithelial compartment of the gut through creation of organoids and matrix gel, and including in the culture medium drivers of stem cell proliferation. And so that's shown here at the top. And of course, I, you know, anyone who works with epithelial cells now is aware of the enormous impact that work had. And the two papers that came out in 2017 were a pair of papers describing how to do this with um, endometrial epithelial cells. And so this set our lab, as well as many, many others, on a path of now being able to create tissue banks and have much more access to these cells. We can get them from the clinic, but you only could, you had to use them right away. Um, so, uh, so that happened. How could we bring really this organoid approach to the endometrium? So we had to make a detour through the intestine. Again, it, it has to do with money. The methods to culture these organoids are very expensive. And so if you're going to learn lessons and develop protocols, doing it in the gut is very valuable. Okay, so I'm going to take a little detour to the gut and provide you motivation for why in the context of organs on chips, that would be valuable. 
Um, we had previously, through work um, that led to the commercialization of the liver chip, become fascinated by problems in preclinical drug development, particularly idiosyncratic toxicity, which is illustrated here. And it's a very credible hypothesis held up by much clinical and ex other experimental data, um, is that uh, you can see a drug exert effects, uh, bad effects in a patient population, even though it got through early stages of clinical trial, because the drug may synergize, the metabolism of the drug may synergize with inflammation and stress the cells out so that you get a crash of the liver. And you can get inflammation in the liver by having um, increased permeability of the gut, leaky gut, and that can come about for a lot of different reasons. And so these together may drive leaky gut. But of course, there's many, many reasons beyond this to examine gut liver interactions. There are many pathological situations that do not, that are disease uh, related that aren't even drug related that make this a very interesting problem. So how can we study these kinds of organ interactions? Um, uh, there's an enormous number of technologies, as uh, you know, if you're watching this, that um, have been developed to grow what we call organs on chips. Um, and a lot of them, though, were developed for purposes of doing preclinical um, admin and tox. So we, there are many technologies for organs on chips, but a lot of them have been developed explicitly to be useful in uh, problems in preclinical admin and tox. And this is a beautiful paper from a um, really uh, well-established group. Um, Mike Schuler is one of the, and Jay Hickman are one of the pioneers in the field. And they have focused here on interacting organ systems to uh, to unravel some toxicology questions. And what you'll notice though, is that the kinds of systems they use and set up, which are appropriate for that, include features that would be very problematic for studying some of the diseases we're interested in. Fetal bovine serum can um, cause dedifferentiation of epithelial cells. Cortisol is a very important regulator of inflammation and sex steroid hormone action. And here it's included at 200 times the physiological concentration as is insulin at over a thousand times the concentration. So the conditions that are useful for assays of toxicology may not be appropriate for studying disease models. And so we've been thinking about this for many decades, actually. I got involved in this field working with a liver transplant surgeon and realizing that we really needed better models of liver disease so that we could cure liver diseases instead of doing transplants. This led to a very um, uh, long and a period of developing a number of different bioreactor systems, including the precursors to the CM bio liver chip. I won't go into all the details. We simply um, reasoned that we could create little 3D perfused uh, tissues in a somewhat easy to set up experimental way by using a simple scaffold that we seeded with cells and a membrane that distributes flow throughout all of these different channels somewhat uniformly. Um, crucial to this, after we established that this would keep certain functions of liver uh, going a long time in culture, um, is that people wanted to use it in a multi-well plate format. So we adapted it to a multi well plate format at MIT, and then where we have an onboard pumping system that lets us perfuse the scaffold where the cells are in a very, very controlled way for weeks at a time if we want. And then CN Bio has made this into a product that is much easier for the average user, including the students in my own laboratory, to use for problems in liver. Now we've applied this and CM Bio has applied this to a number of problems. And an advantage of the approach we take is that the intrinsic platform technology, whether it's the precursor that I'm showing here that came from our lab, which was micro machine or the new versions that are in the PhysioMix system from CM Bio, they were created with the idea that you must be able to do pharmacokinetics of very lipophilic compounds. Now, I'm interested in sex steroids, so I care a lot about does my um, platform absorb the molecule that's controlling my cell function. And PDMS or silicon rubber, as other um, elastomers, does absorb lipophilic compounds quite, quite avidly. So it's very difficult to control the concentrations of these in any kind of temporal way. And so this is why we have focused on using thermoplastics in all of our um, 
and on, on all of our applications. And we've got a lot of new technologies in the lab that I'm not going to have a chance to talk about today that are based on uh, microfluidics that are not thermoplastic. So an example abney talks problem that still involves immunology and requires these sophisticated systems is a project that we did with Amgen to decipher why the anti-IL-6 um, antibody, receptor antibody tocilizumab changed the metabolism of certain small molecule drugs, those like Simvastatin that are metabolized by cytochrome P453A4. And so this project required that we have an immunologically competent liver and that it um, be able to be cultured for weeks and cult and at a time to simulate inflammation, such as a patient with arthritis, and then treat the inflammation with tocilizumab and see if you can induce those changes. And in fact, we could. And so we co published this with Amgen. Um, but I want to turn now to those higher order interactions, gut liver and ultimately the endometrium with the bone marrow, for example. And to do uh, anything in that arena, we needed a much um, broader kind of platform that could interconnect organ systems. And so we were supported by DARPA and we demonstrated a proof of, we showed a proof of principle demonstration of a 10 organ system that kept 10 different organ systems alive for a month. And in the seven way version of this um, did a fairly comprehensive pharmacokinetic study to predict the fate of drugs based on how they behaved in the individual systems. Now I'll highlight that a huge, huge feature that we are making new advances in uh, now in my lab and that we value tremendously is that we have these onboard pumps. They're very safe for pumping cells. They're deterministic, meaning you can go over a huge range of um, flow rates. And so this gives you a lot of flexibility to connect organ systems together and to ex start examining crosstalk between organs. If we come back now briefly, and then I'm going to get back to the endometrium, to the gut liver, or well, I'm going to bounce back and forth, to the gut liver interactions um, that we talked about earlier, it's now possible with this kind of platform technology to um, use deterministic pumping to create flow patterns that mimic somewhat the kinds of flow the liver gets, because it gets only about 25% of its um, blood supply from the systemic circulation, and most of it comes from the gut. So we can recapitulate that by putting different pumps on the platform that pump in the right uh, proportions to create a little um, gut model with the liver model, liver chip type liver model. And you can see it implemented here. This is a three-way interaction where we have gut liver and we can put a brain here, we can add immune cells, et cetera. And we, we have done all of these things. So there's many publications now on this platform and more coming out. Instead of a 10 organ platform, we tend to focus on um, two or three way interactions because to do a really good job of tissue engineering of any one organ is incredibly resource intensive. So we we're focusing on some very uh, pointed questions in interactions. One of them, for example, was spearheaded by Martin Trapachar, a postdoc in the lab, um, who did a couple of studies, one on gut liver with primary human cells and also gut liver brain, which was just accepted for publication in Science Advances. And here, he was very interested in how um, short chain fatty acids that are produced by fermentation in the gut, which we'll come to in a moment again, um, are absorbed and get transported to the liver partially metabolized, but can influence the brain. They can influence the development of microglia in the brain as well as their function. And so there's a lot of controversy about how these um, short chain fatty acids may influence either positively or negatively various immune functions. And he unraveled by using the platform some non-intuitive and unexpected relationships between the short chain fatty acids and the immune system, depending on whether the patient had an inflammatory disease or not. So there's some fascinating things that I won't focus on in this talk because there's a lot of immunology I would have to go into. I'm going to briefly take a segue back into synthetic matrices and then end up with platform technologies for um, the gut. So as we, when we left off, we had a synthetic matrix that was suitable for co-culture of epithelia and stroma, but we hadn't really demonstrated that it would work for all of the different spectrum of behaviors that you get from epithelia, particularly expansion of those epithelial organoids from the intestine or from the endometrium. And there's a lot of reasons why matrigel, um, it's, you know, it's good for expansion and it works, but there's some drawbacks to matrigel. So um, Victor Hernandez-Gordillo 
in the lab. Um, he's not going to show a poster today. This is leftover. Um, he developed a way that we could culture these in a completely synthetic matrix. And so um, he first did a screen and he used that uh, parameter space uh, that I showed you earlier, where we think about the nature of the integrins on the cell, the nature of the stiffness of the matrices and so on. And he screened parameter space and he focused particularly on um, a ligand for alpha-2, beta-1, which is known to ex be expressed by cells in the crypt in the colon, and did a screen with both mouse um, a colon, which is very, very easy to grow. I think it probably will grow on Kleenex, but the human cells are much harder to grow. And so he at included those and the colon it being the hardest, at least in our hands and the hands of most people that work in. So he did a screen, um, to my empirically, and identified a composition of matrix, and this has been published, um, and again, we're having it evaluated for commercialization, um, that included a ligand for this integrin that could be degraded by cells and that also include these binders for the basement membrane components so that it stabilizes the um, things, uh, matrix produced by the cells. And just to be convincing that you do need this ligand, if you do a one amino acid change in that ligand, you see here you're, you're just switching this one out for this one, you see that you abrogate the response to the ligand. You really can't get anything but cells just sitting in the matrix. So this matrix allows the expansion of the primary um, epithelial organoids, and it results in um, some features of the stem cell compartment. For example, um, here you see these proliferating cells, you see CD44, which is a um, stem cell compartment. And the, the organoids in this matrix grow a bit slower than in matrix gel, but they also exhibit a longer lived morphology. So there's some advantages because you, have, you can control the degradation rate of this particular matrix. Um, and finally, they also allow clonal growth. So in matrix gel, a lot of times you have fusion. If you adjust the matrix properties um, appropriately, you can actually see organoids um, grow clonally. And this is tracking some organoids over time. Okay, so that work has led into a lot of tissue engineering applications. I'll hint at again at the very end of the talk. So let's come back now um, to uh, what we would want in terms of we, um, the device. So I've talked a lot about this. We've kind of slayed that dragon. Let's come back to other parts of this wish list, which is how do we control flow, particularly anaerobic flow, and how do we co-culture with microbes? So we've got one down and a lot to go, but it'll go fast. So if you look in the literature on um, devices, there's a number of gut on chip devices with more published even since I made this slide. And when you look at them, though, there's not a single one um, until we published our work this summer that was capable of culturing the most strict anaerobes. And in the colon, you have a mix of microbes that some of them can tolerate oxygen. Some of them um, are, uh, are strictly anaerobic, but a little teeny bit of oxygen won't kill them. And then there's the super, super fastidious organisms for which a little tiny bit of oxygen really, really, really impairs their survival. And in that realm is um, uh, some microbes I'll talk about. So what we wanted to do was build a physiomimetic platform that leveraged the kinds of pumping technologies and other platform technologies that we developed for liver and interactome and actually have a transwell because most people in the field are familiar and use transwells, have a transwell system that would allow a continuous apical flow of medium across the top of the transwell and recirculation of the basolateral media to nourish these. And this could also have a continuous inlet and outlet, but the recirculation to make sure that this stays oxygenated is very important. And the trick here is that this has to be completely, totally anaerobic. It's much harder than you think to make this happen on a continuing basis. And so this was the uh, work of um, Yu Zha Wang and Bob Zhang. Bob is still in the lab. Um, so this is what the device looks like. We've now had this replicated and are initiating a number of collaborations um, with companies and academics to use this. Uh, it allows, it separates, it has an upper and lower chamber. You put the transwells in, you close it up, and this is the flow pattern that emerges. And so notice one thing here. This is not completely drawn to scale because it looks like the epithelial cells, which are probably 50 microns tall, 
are close to the top here. In fact, this distance is three millimeters. So this actually should be drawn, if it were drawn to scale, it would be off the screen. And that's important because it allows us to have an apical flow that isn't super fast. And so the bacteria, the mucus layer can accumulate and the bacteria can grow in the mucus layer and you don't really disturb it by pulling, you know, put, moving that flow across the top of it. Um, and so the GUMI, we call it the GUMI device, gut mi microbe immune, it um, lets you culture a beautiful monolayer of colon epithelia um, with different cell types present. And this has been published, this was published in um, the new cell journal Med. I apologize, I don't have the reference here, but you can email me. Um, and so this image shows a co-culture after uh, three days in culture of human colon, which is the relevant epithelium for the most anaerobic parts of the GI system. And what you're seeing here is um, the nuclei of the epithelial cells that were cultured on transwell. And then you see this cloud of the microbe fecal bacterium proudsnitzi, which I'll describe more in a moment. Um, and this is living in a mucus layer that's separated from the epithelium by a thick cross-linked layer of mucus. So you can see this gap, and then you see these cells. In the normal colon, you have a highly cross-linked mucus layer right up against um, the surface of the, the apical surface, and then a more loosely cross-linked uh, mucus layer here. And so there were, was, during the experiment, continuous flow of culture medium across the top of the mucus layer, but the microbes inhabited the mucus layer and were very metabolically active. Um, so we, in this uh, study, were using the um, microbe F. prausnitzi, um, which metabolizes uh, fiber into butyrate. So the short-chain fatty acids I described earlier, butyrate, are metabolized uh, by that. And so we find that the GUMI, um, without, for, first of all, with no microbes, uh, uh, and we compared all of these different conditions and it influenced differentiation. It also influenced um, some of the accumulation of the autocrine apical loops, and I won't go into that a lot, that's in the paper. Um, and so we chose F. prausnitzi to study in detail because it's one of the dominant species in the microbiome, um, as you can see here, and we also studied uh, to a lesser extent these other two microbes, B. theta and E. rectale, um, which are also prominent. But it's also fecal bacterium prausnitzi is tremendously associated with certain disease states. Um, its deficiency is noted in colitis and in um, inflammatory bowel disease. So there's a negative association. If you lack F. prausnitzi and the rubric is that you're making less butyrate, et cetera. Um, and it's also been positively associated with anti-inflammatory properties. So we really wanted to um, demonstrate we could culture it. In fact, um, we can culture this and other microbes um, in the, uh, the GUMI device up to very high titers, um, similar to what you would get in the colon of a donor. So this is the um, increase in titer over time. And then we demonstrated that and this is in a culture medium that contains some precursors for butyrate, that only when you had the F. prausnitzi, you would get um, butyrate produced in the apical media. So this is three short chain fatty acids and you're getting production of butyrate by the F. prausnitzi here. That butyrate is actually transmitted into the basal lateral media as it would be in vivo. And you'll notice the concentration here is slightly higher than here. This is because we're measuring the bulk concentration, mixing what's in the mucus with what's in, with what's in that three millimeters of extra headspace um, that has media constantly flowing through it. And we think that the butyrate is being um, very high concentration at the apical membrane and transported into the basolateral compartment. Um, also, we see in the epithelia, we see that um, genes that respond to butyrate, that the metabolism of the epithelial cells, the luminal epithelia use butyrate as a metabolic substrate. They are, these metabolic pathways are very evident in these cultures. Um, and there's also many immune pathways that are regulated by these, including the TLR pathways that respond to bacterial ligands. So um, what we're seeing in this um, culture system made possible by the fact that we're culturing for several days and not just acutely, other culture systems for F. prausnitzi with epithelia require that you purge 
the um, top, put a stopper in it, and it's cultured in a static mode. And in static mode, you quickly deplete the nutrients that are there for the bacteria. So this is a continuous mode, allowing us to reach a homeostasis. Um, and so we're particularly interested in some of the immune regulators as shown here. Um, and there's some biology that we're still investigating having to do with uh, um, what, what sort of a, a different competing effects in the regulation. So I'm going to end here returning to um, one other outstanding, which is microvascular and lymph drainage and the crypt lumen structure. We've, we've addressed the other three. And one is coming back to the crypt lumen structure, returning to the endometrium. We've successfully cultured um, the endometrial organoids in these hydrogels and found that we can drive um, creation of gland lumen structures by modulating the gel to allow fusion of organoids. And this is simply showing um, cross sections at the top, looking at the lumen side, you see beautiful epithelial structure. And then if we move down into this invagination, we see a gland-like structure there. Um, and so we're now using this to investigate aspects of inflammation in the endometrium, for example, showing that if we simulate a menstrual cycle um, and we do it either control or inflamed conditions, we inhibit the normal maturation as would be evidenced by production of prolactin here in the secretory phase. Um, and we also um, dysregulate the uh, structure if we have an inflammatory cue here, IL-1 beta. Um, I'm now going to um, end up on the perfusible microvascular networks with one more slide after this. We're now modeling the birth of endometriosis lesions, combining um, a lesion model of an organoid and stroma putting it in the context of a microvascular bed using microfluidics technology developed by Roger Cam at MIT, and we have an NIH grant doing this. And so although COVID shut the lab down for a while, the students were able to recapitulate some of Roger Cam's work um, in which you create a perfused microvascular bed between two um, channels. So here you can see two channels, and this is a movie showing immune cells, monocytes labeled with cell tracker green, and you can see that they can move from one side of this to the other. And this is a now commercial device from Roger, but we have built a whole suite of new microfluidic tools that combine these with our pumps so that we can continuously culture these for weeks at a time and expose them to simulated menstrual cycles and to therapies. So I'll end there and say um, that we're at a stage in the field that's super exciting because we can move into more complex disease modeling. We're struggling as a field to understand how what we build in culture relates back to in vivo. But as we're able to control, gain more and more control over everything from the tissue engineering to the microfluidics and the systems biology, I think we're in a headed in a very good place of gradually replacing some of the animal models that don't capture the features of these diseases. Um, I will sh have a special shout out to to my main collaborator, Doug Laufenberger. We have an integrated lab and an integrated household because we're married. This was his first student who um, defended her thesis on an endometriosis topic. And of course, a huge shout out to our physiomimetics team, particularly Dave Trumper, our mechatronics colleague, who is the brilliant genius behind the pumps and almost everything having to do with the platform, and Rebecca Carrier at Northeastern University, who is really, really a leader in gut engineering and who drove a lot of the work that you saw here. And of course, to CN Bio for always being a fantastic partner and helping us get these into a form that everybody else can use. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Linda. I'm sure you'll all agree that there have been some excellent points that have been raised during this presentation. So we'll now begin the Q&A session. Speaker. Please enter your question into the box on the right hand side of your screen and click submit. We'll answer as many questions as possible during the time available. We've already, we've already had a few questions come in, so we're going to dive straight into the first one. How challenging is it to develop an aerobic anaerobic mucosal model in a microphysiological system? So 
Um, that's a great question. It took us about five years to develop that uh, platform that we're using. <clears throat> and so you, you have to have a lot of different kinds of expertise. We built uh, a lot on our DARPA platform expertise. It is extremely difficult to control the apical anaerobic um, oxygen concentration while you have flow. And I think our publication, which is in a new cell journal, Med, I'm sorry, I forgot to cite it. Um, it was probably, I think, the first one to really show that you could do that continuously and culture such a sensitive bacterium. So it's very, very challenging. Uh, and we're trying to get this out so more people can use it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, on to our next question. When developing your hydrogel matrices for your various mucosal barriers, did you implement them into a microphysiological system? Or was it all done in standard static conditions? So we've used the hydrogels in a number of different formats. We've certainly, um, in our publication uh, on the 10 organ system, there were uh, hydrogels used in that to create the endometrium model described in that paper. So we have used them in a transwell format. We're currently now putting them into the microfluidic devices I showed you at the very end in collaboration with Roger Cam. So uh, we're also in discussion with a company to commercialize them because we've shared them with many labs around the world and people find them very useful. And we now are doing customer support for a lot of people. So we're hoping to get them as a product so people can just buy them. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, next question. How are the mechanical effects of flow, shear stress and transmural pressure on the cells taken into account in the model? Are all cells subjected to the same shear stress or not? And to what degree does this make a difference to your system? So I think it really depends on which of the particular microphysiological systems. We certainly take into account shear stress and other mechanics. Um, when we designed the original liver chip, this was a major consideration and our original publications have a lot of calculations about that. Um, so I think it's you know really dependent on which incarnation we're using and we describe these kinds of effects in our papers. So I encourage you to look at the papers. You can write me if you don't have them, but we, we pretty much do describe things in those papers because the flow, flow though, you have to keep in mind, many people have attributed effects to mechanical forces that may be arising from just better refreshment of medium. So there's a number of papers in the gut literature that attribute phenomenological changes they see in going from a static system to a flow system to the consequences of shear stress, when in fact, just refreshment rate of the medium plays a huge role, particularly if you're using KCO2 cells, which are extremely, extremely voracious eaters of the glucose. So you, you have to be careful to take into account everything that's going on and not just be single-minded that it's always mechanics or it's always something else. There's an integration of things. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, next question, great talk. Roger Cam platform uses HUVCs. What is the current status on organ-specific endothelial cell sourcing in the gut or endometrial environment? So Roger has definitely published a lot on Hubex and we have used Hubex with him, but we also have with Roger used uh, induced pluripotent stem cell sources. We are now putting uterine endothelial cells. Roger and I are working together on a uterine uh, project. So there is a natural progression in a lot of these fields that you see, not just our lab, but other work using easier to use cell sources to get something uh, up and running and understand the principles of how it works. And then you transition into more tissue specific. It is very, very true that the endothelia can be um, tissue specific. And in situations like endometriosis or tumors, they may also be recruited from the circulation. And so these are areas of active investigation that we haven't published on, but that we're working on in lab right now. This is very important. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, next question. Can you integrate transepithelial, endothelial electrical resistance measurements into your system? Um, you know, we thought a lot about that. And there are people who've published that. 
Um, however, tear is a very crude measure of epithelial function. So I think if, you know, people in a lot of preclinical talks uh, communities like tear because it's a metric and you can kind of see big changes, but how it relates to in vivo is really not always clear. So we haven't focused on tear because we can do um, other kinds of permeability me measurements based on molecular tracers that are a bit more informative and the work that it would take to put tear in just didn't seem to be worth it to us for the amount of information we get out, especially as we're moving toward a more 3D structure where the whole tier measurement it becomes less and less clear what it means. Brilliant, thank you very much. Our next question, is it possible to culture epithelium in the GUMI at an air liquid interface while maintaining an anaerobic environment in the apical chamber? So we haven't tried that. Um, I'm sure anything is possible. Uh, I, I think, you know, you would just have to design the experiment. I think you would, I don't, I'm sure we could do it. it. There's a lot of issues when you do something like that to make sure you have appropriate humidity still so you don't dry everything out. Um, we just never tried to do it because it you know, and, and I think there's some uh, interest in simulating an air interface like because you have gas in the colon and there's, you know, kind of bl blurbs of gas that move through. But again, it wasn't a huge driving force and we weren't, you know, focused on that because the liquid-liquid interface, the mucus layer and all of that seemed to be what most people who ever talked to us about this device wanted to do. Excellent, thank you very much. Next question. Is it possible to accommodate the gut contraction features in the gut organoids model? So we have talked a lot about that and Roger Cam actually has a little bit going on in his lab with that. Uh, the device we have now is not specifically geared for that. However, it is, it, you know, it's a huge research area for the future. So it's not something we, we are doing right now. Brilliant, thank you very much. Next question. Could you share your experiences related to culture of liver, sinusoidal endothelial cells in those organs on chips models? Yeah, so I haven't, uh, we, we've done a little, we, we have a couple of papers where we published on rat sinusoidal endothelial cells when we were first developing the liver chip. And it turns out you can support them in the liver chip without VEGF. They're very sensitive to the shear stresses though. Um, for human, we purchased, we had not been in a situation to really routinely work with them. It's, you need quite a bit of infrastructure to routinely work with human liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. We did purchase some from a vendor, but we found that they really didn't have the characteristics of LSCCs. So we haven't pursued that. We, we are currently though working with Rudolf Yanish's lab. He's a stem cell, IPS stem cell on, um, on differentiating iPSCs into LSCC phenotypes. And there's, a, of course, an enormous amount of activity in that space of ontogeny uh, driven uh, development. So it's not something we're actively uh, doing on a major scale because to use the adults, you really do need to have a lot of infrastructure. Excellent, thank you. Uh, just got time for another two questions. Um, so the next question, any possible effects of products produced by bacteria locally? Yeah, so the bacteria that we cultured were making butyrate and we could see enormous number of changes in the epithelia. Actually more genes were uh, changed by the presence of the bacteria than by just putting things in flow. So the paper uh, is in the new cell journal MED. They launched that journal this summer and we're actually volume one, page one of the new MED journal by cell. It's one of their flagship journals. So it's unfortunately not open access. Although I think the paper is open access. Brilliant, thank you. And that brings us to our last question. Have you evaluated complex microbial communities representing health and disease in in the model organs on chips? Yeah. So we have done a little bit of that um, and we're just launching into that now. And our the wonderful postdoc, Bob Zhang, who's doing that work has an experimental design. It's, it's something you have to approach thoughtfully because there's a lot of different ways. You have to think through what communities you get and so on and so forth. So this is certainly, we're writing grants on that right now.
<clears throat> Brilliant. Thank you so much again, Linda. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Just to remind everyone, any questions that we didn't have time to get to, you will be provided with an answer offline as soon as possible. You can continue to ask questions even when you're watching this webinar on demand. The webinar will now be made available on demand. So if you've got friends or colleagues that you think may be interested in this webinar, then please feel free to share the link. A certificate of attendance is available to download from the handouts tab, which is on the right hand side of your webinar platform. Thank you again for your time, Linda. Okay, it's okay. fun to be part of this. Thanks for listening.